Welcome back, everybody, to the Additive Snack Podcast. I'm your host, Fabian Allefeld, and today we welcome back Tim Berry. Last year in February, we talked to Tim when he was at Launcher. Now the company is called Bast. And back then we discussed various applications in the space industry and its interface to additive manufacturing. In the meantime, Tim has now joined Jet Zero as the head of manufacturing and quality. And I'm super excited to welcome him back and talk about Jet Zero and the future of aviation. If you don't know Jet Zero, no problem, because today we will dive into how they're pioneering the really the new era of aircraft design with their blended wing design. And uh, we'll also, of course, touch on the impacts of additive manufacturing in that space. So I'm super excited about this episode. It'll help us to understand a little bit more of the current state of additive in the aviation industry in general, uh, the power of additive manufacturing in driving new innovative designs, but also how additive manufacturing can change the aviation industry to better. So without any further ado, Tim, welcome back to the Additive Snack Podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Excited to talk to you today. Additive is one of my favorite topics. I know, I know. And uh, you've been an additive for uh, for quite some time. And we'll touch on, about, on that in a second. But before we do so, um, can you give us an overview of Jet Zero? What's your mission? And uh, what's your, 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 your piece of the puzzle in the current and future aviation industry? Yeah, absolutely. So Jet Zero is developing a uh, blended wing body uh, aircraft. Um, so uh, the difference is really the shape of the aircraft. You know, we, we like to say that our, our mission is to reshape aviation uh, overall. Um, since uh, 1903 to uh, 1963, there was a tremendous amount of innovation in the aviation industry, um, all the way from the Wright Flyer, the first powered flight, um, to the 737-100 uh, uh, aircraft. And then since then, in the you know following 60 years up until today, uh, they effectively just made the same tube and wing planes longer. Um, and most of the efficiency wins have been uh, uh, through engine technology. Um, so as the engine manufacturers continue to find opportunities to make uh, their products more efficient, um, we see the need to also take a look at the airframe uh, and the shape of the aircraft. We like to say that we are a startup with a 30-year history. Um, the blended wing body concept was developed by some of our founders uh, back in the late 80s uh, in yeah. response to a, a NASA solicitation that was put out. Um, and in the years since then, uh, they've continued to mature the technology, whether at um, Boeing or NASA. Um, with significant investment from NASA to the tune of over a billion dollars um, over the years into BWB research. The key differentiating factor for a BWB um, is the liftover drag performance. So um, when you look at pictures of our aircraft online, it just looks like it's made to fly. It's it's a great shape of an airfoil. Um, on a tube and wing aircraft, uh, a lot of the outboard components, engines, um, so, some of the other structural parts, uh, they're effectively just adding drag with the, the wings really being the primary source of lift. On a blended wing body, um, the fuselage uh, is also uh, a lifting body. Uh, so from our uh, projections, uh, we estimate about a 50% reduction in fuel burn uh, per passenger seat mile can be accomplished with this new shape of aircraft, um, which obviously has a lot of financial benefits uh, for the industry, burning less fuel, reducing fuel cost which is the largest single item uh, on a airline's profit and loss statement, mm -hmm. um, but also a lot of environmental benefits, right? 50% uh, less fuel is 50% less emissions. And also the BWB that we're building uh, will be capable of incorporating sustainable aviation fuels uh, as they proliferate and come to market. And also, uh, you know, in the mid to late 2030s, uh, hydrogen uh, aircraft, um, building a hydrogen aircraft as well. Super interesting. And yeah, you're, you're right. Um, and if you also watch some of the recent documentaries around, uh, some of the major players in the aviation space today, then, um, innovation has kind of stalled. Yeah. Now, um, 
Innovation typically starts when there is no competition. So now you guys are pushing in uh, into the market as a new as a new player. Um, which 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 sector of the uh, commercial aviation space are you guys trying to uh, to tap into? Yeah, great question. So um, first and foremost, um, we are developing a uh, commercial jetliner. Um, we have two other variants uh, that uh, we're working on as well, uh, which is a, a freighter. Uh, mm -hmm. BWB has a lot of benefits from a volume perspective of how much freight it can carry. Um, and a uh, military variant um, where we're building a demonstrator for the U.S. Air Force uh, under a contract, um, $235 million contract in partnership with Northrop Grumman, um, who's a, a strategic partner of ours uh, on the demonstrator project. The military's interest in uh, the blended wing is really for the fuel efficiency benefits uh, for use as an air-to-air -air refueling tanker. Um, in terms of the actual commercial market, uh, we're targeting uh, a mid-market aircraft, um, you know, 250 passengers on average. Um, that would fit into uh, today's gate. So no major modifications to aircraft, uh, airport infrastructure that are required. Interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, that's also a, a market today that's only, that's possibly a, a, a duopoly except for a few uh, additional smaller, uh, smaller players. And if I look at back at your history, uh, which is uh, you are a, a SpaceX alumni, and SpaceX was, again, one of those uh, companies that kind of challenged the status quo uh, and challenged the existing players that were not innovating uh, back then in the, uh, in the space industry. Can you tell us a little bit about um, kind of your history from uh, SpaceX over the launcher and MAST and uh, how you're bringing some of those experience uh, into the uh, Jet Zero team? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the great parts about um, the space business overall is uh, dedication to um, rapid iteration, right? So um, challenging requirements, deleting parts, uh, building, testing, breaking stuff, learning, incorporating those uh, learnings back into the design uh, when the stakes are low. Um, so that's one of the primary things um, that I think I bring to um, this new industry, uh, which is, you know, a focus on a high sense of urgency, rapid iteration, um, operating hardware rich, uh, building things, breaking them, learning, uh, and really getting to the most optimal possible design uh, in the fastest amount of time possible. Um, because, uh, you know, for some companies, uh, innovation can drag out a bit. Uh, there's sometimes a, an analysis paralysis where uh, they don't want to try things or, or invest in the research and development. So I think the, you know, we can take a page out of the space industries book um, in the development phase uh, to really push the envelope of what's possible and develop new technologies that that'll benefit um, aircraft manufacturing overall. Interesting. Um, you know, before we dive into, into Jet Zero and its additive manufacturing um, potential applications, what is your perspective on the current state of additive manufacturing adoption in the, in the aviation sector? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say, I wouldn't exactly call it nascent. Um, I think there's been a lot of great companies um, that have adopted additive manufacturing for use on commercial aircraft overall. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we've fully leveraged uh, the potential of uh, additives in the aviation industry. I think mostly it's a lot of small components um, whereas, you know, with um, new platforms and build volumes coming out, there's the opportunity to take on larger components, more complex components. Um, with the proliferation of generative design and, and topological optimization, uh, it's also possible to make uh, highly optimized structural components as well. Um, so I think additive uh, has come a long way uh, in the uh, aviation sector, um, you know, especially with uh, the FA releasing the uh, AC33.15-3 uh, for laser powder bed fusion, uh, which is a great uh, guiding document uh, for certification of AM components. Um, and, you know, I've, I've always said it's it's a similar thing or or formerly was a uh, an issue in the space business uh, where additive parts are considered uh, guilty until proven innocent, right? They're kind of newer, 
um, more novel technology, so they're not uh, readily adopted. I think that trend is shifting in aviation overall, um, especially with um, the increased availability of data that comes along with additively manufactured components versus, say, forgings or castings. Um, and so I think um, I, I think we've come a long way, but there's a long way to go. And I think there's many more applications and opportunities to leverage the benefits of additives um, in the aviation sector and especially on a commercial jetliner aircraft. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one thing that's 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 really interesting, and well, I think we'll touch on certification a bit later. I don't want to dive into that one yet. But what is interesting is that the existing platforms today have a long leg legacy, which in certain cases is, is beneficial to these uh, quite complex systems. But on the other hand, also are a liability or a, a challenge in order to implement new technologies and, uh, and new approaches. Now you guys at Jet Zero don't have a, le a legacy, which, which also can be, can be a luxury, right? If we compare it to the early days of the, the space revolution, uh, that was probably one of the advantages of, of SpaceX is to be able to reconsider and rethink, uh, rethink the whole system. Um, what does it mean for, for Jet Zero in being able to adopt new technologies such as additive manufacturing into their design and manufacturing processes? Yeah, I think additive allows us to more rapidly iterate, build hardware faster, um, test out designs and decrease the overall lead time uh, for the learning cycle. Um, additionally, uh, one of the benefits of additive is eliminating a lot of the tooling uh, that's required that could drive a, a high amount of cost, um, you know, or say dyes or molds uh, for casting. Um, that it it eliminates a lot of the overhead um, of being able to produce a lot of different uh, different iterations of a part uh, quickly. Um, additionally, you know, additive allows you to really tailor material properties and opens up a, a wider array of materials, um, for producing parts. As you said, uh, we're not encumbered by, um, any legacy systems or legacy hardware or processes. So, you know, I like to say that we have the benefit of designing and building this aircraft, uh, in a year that starts in a, a 20 and not an IT. Yeah. Um, so we can leverage all the, the great digital technology that's come out. And I think additive is, is a big part of that. So it gives us the opportunity to consolidate components, um, delete parts overall, reduce the complexity. Um, and you know, the primary thing is really to be able to build things, test them quickly, uh, and learn faster so that we can get to an optimal design, um, without having to wait on tooling lead times or casting dies or molds or anything like that. Yeah. And I remember in our uh, previous conversation last year, those were a lot of the same benefits of additive that uh, you guys leveraged when you were back at uh, Vast and uh, in general in the space industry, that fast turnaround time uh, that accelerates innovation, as well as deleting applications. Um, definitely, definitely interesting. Can you talk about a, a specific application that you guys are looking at? I'm sure there's there's uh, many you can talk about, but is there a certain um, a certain project or piece of hardware that uh, seems very interesting from an additive perspective today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I I would say uh, our subscale program. Uh, you know, we're building subscale units to validate uh, different parts of the aircraft, different parts of the design, flight control laws, so on and so forth. Um, so the subscale program is really the opportunity that we have to to trial uh, additive parts. Um, and the focus of that program is rapid iteration uh, to learn fast um, and and ultimately inform the the full scale design of the aircraft. Um, so that's, you know, we're looking at everything from landing gear components to structural uh, bracketry, um, any potential fluid handling applications that we might have. Um, all of those are are the areas where additive can lend a lot of benefit. You know, I'm, I'm a huge advocate for additives. Obviously, I've spent a large uh, part of my career working in additive. Um, but I think someone that's the, the right application of additive is not print everything all the time. It's really leveraging uh, those applications where additive lends the most benefit. 
Um, and, you know, one of the core opportunities that I've seen uh, is in, you know, structural and mechanical assemblies um, using additive to consolidate what was typically, you know, just an example, say 30 independently machine discrete parts that have to be fastened together uh, into a single topologically optimized um, uh, part. So mm -hmm. I, I think structural components and fluid components um, are the primary applications that we're looking at right now, um, but additive can be applied in a lot of places. So uh, we're certainly exploring all the different opportunities we have to to leverage its benefits. Super cool. Um, I'm curious. So you, as you just mentioned, have a lot of experience in in various additive manufacturing programs. But I would uh, I can imagine that not all of your design and innovation teams have a similar experience. How do you guys approach that? How do you distill that information down through the organization? How do you ensure that people think of all manufacturing technologies, including additive uh, from the beginning and choose one technology over the other? Yeah, I mean, everything, uh, we like to say that everything has to buy its way onto the airplane, um, whether mm -hmm. it's a manufacturing method or a specific system or part. Um, so first and foremost, it's kind of evangelizing, you know, showing examples of what's possible with AM. Um, all of the, um, companies in the industry that are adopting, uh, metal AM for, you know, FAA certified components, uh, and really like demystifying AM overall, you know, I had said it towards the beginning that edited parts are kind of considered guilty until proven innocent. Um, and, and there's not a, a wide body of knowledge or awareness that, uh, they are being incorporated on, on a lot of, uh, certified and flying systems today. So I think first and foremost, is just building the knowledge base that additive is a viable method for producing parts, um, and highlighting all the benefits that it can lend. Um, and then as we go through trade studies on specific components or systems, um, you know, identifying those opportunities, uh, through the lens that I look through, which is like, you know, these are so many discrete parts or. Um, this is going to require, uh, if we want to get a prototype in our hands, this is going to require a significant tooling investment or NRA investment, um, and really identifying those as opportunities where additive could lend a lot of benefit, um, to produce the components overall. Um, it's always a balance, I would say in the, the, especially in the space that we're in, um, because ultimately everything that we build has to be certifiable to today's standards. Um, but I think, you know. In, in the current design phase, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of opportunities in front of us, um, and using the established FAA guidelines, um, it's, it's helpful for us to kind of navigate through where additive makes sense, uh, and where we have a clear certification pathway. So I guess just to sum it all up, it's building knowledge, it's highlighting examples of where additive can lend benefit and then showing a clear path um, to certification for those components. Okay. How much is the the FAA and the current certification requirements, a support or, um, a, a barrier to, to additive adoption in general, in the aviation industry. Yeah, I would say that the, the FAA has come uh, a long way, um, and, and caught up to industry and what industry is doing. Um, so I, I don't, I, I think it's actually a support, um, you know, they provide very clear guidelines on what needs to happen to parts, um, to be certified. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the big, the bigger hurdle is, is just, yeah, the kind of, um, uh, mental, uh, the thought process and the, the comfort level, I guess is the best way to say it, um, with design engineers that have typically worked with traditional manufacturing methods or on uh, more legacy platforms, uh, is getting them to come around to the fact that, you know, we, the FA has a playbook for this. There's a lot of flying components today. Um, and there is a way that we're, we're going to be able to incorporate this technology, um, where it makes the most sense onto the aircraft. So I wouldn't say it's a, it's a, uh, a, a hindrance or a challenge. Um, you know, as we would expect with any regulatory body, there's certainly rigorous standards that have to be met. Um, but, um, there's a clear pathway to meet them. So I, th I think it's just kind of one of those things where the pathway is clear. Uh, you just have to do it. Well, if, if you have a pathway, at least you can, uh, see the light at the end of the tunnel, right? Uh, it seems yeah, like it's not, it's not a dark road. 
and and really the you know the juice is worth the squeeze uh with additive right you can carve out mass you can reduce part count complexity um even once you're into the kind of rate production and away from that design and rapid iteration phase um you know the ability to uh batch do do batch printing of a lot of components at a single time and and ultimately reduce the cost per part um so all the juice is worth the squeeze there um and then the only thing that remains is just making sure that you have adequate data and uh, and a great cert plan for the parts that you're making yeah what what do you envision the the supply chain looking like is uh is jet zero more of an in-house manufacturing and vertically integrated uh company are you going to leverage existing aviation suppliers what what, what does the 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 objective look like there so i can speak um on the company generally and then i can speak uh specifically for additive mm -hmm. um so the company generally um you know we have a lot of excellent tier one partners um that we're working with that are currently supplying you know certified systems in the market today Uh, which I think has been a, a great strategy for us and, and helps us to de-risk our, our timeline overall. Um, we're, we're not, you know, trying to boil the ocean or, or necessarily build everything ourselves. Um, so I think uh, on, you know, the company writ large, it's, it's a focus on making things where uh, we can benefit, where we see a, a large benefit, and we have the opportunity to certify on, on the timeline that makes sense. Um, and then As it relates specifically to additives, um, that will likely be an, an insourced um, thing for Jet Zero. Um, you know, I, I think it's one of those methods where you really want to have control, um, the ability to have the printers on site, uh, enables you to do the rapid iteration that I spoke about before, and then also ultimately control and be responsible for your process in the future, um, and really kind of navigate uh, your schedule where it makes sense. Additionally, um, you know, there's a lot of... Um, uh machining suppliers machine shops uh that don't process a lot of additive parts um and, and aren't necessarily comfortable with them although i will say there's been some amazing strides in in cam software over the past few years uh to incorporate additive parts and make it easier to say like you know probing schemes and reposting the code so you can you can get a much better picture of the part before you start machining it um But given, you know, the complexities of machining additive parts, um, I think it makes sense. It's one of those things that makes sense to insource in our use case. Um, but I, I certainly see, you know, demand out there in the market for um, for other companies in the space business or those that maybe don't want to make the initial capital investment to be able to leverage the service providers uh, that exist today. So I guess just to sum it all up, um, we likely will pursue in-house uh, additives and, and post-machining ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. But I do certainly see a place in the market for uh, service uh, providers, especially where the company doesn't have a lot of experience in additives um, and a service provider uh, can lend that experience and know-how to help them produce their parts. Um, and additionally, um, you know, if they're at a, a smaller stage or uh, an earlier stage where um, the capital investment to buy their own printer just doesn't make sense to get parts in here. Yeah. No, we see that strategy a lot where, especially in the uh, development phase, where you know, companies do see that strategic benefits of at least initially uh, ramping up production in-house, potentially identifying certain applications that they uh, then eventually do outsource to uh, to suppliers, uh, but keep that capability and, uh, and knowledge in-house. Yeah, absolutely. You can use, um, you can also leverage uh, sort of service providers for search capacity, right? You know, if you're, um, you see like a large spike in your production rate um, and you need to produce more components. Uh, the great part about additive is, is you know, for the most part, you can take uh, a print that was made on, on one platform and, you know, port it over to another platform as long as that platform has, you know, similar um, or, or another printer, I should say. Uh, as long as that printer has the same, you know, quality control standards and meets the same uh, certification requirements, uh, then it's easy to flex around um, for additional capacity when needed. So I think that's another great benefit about it. If um, you can tell I'm a fanboy, yeah, yeah, you uh, for sure are a fanboy, and you you have been for uh, for a while. Been shouting the uh, the additive benefits from uh, the top of the uh, the roofs. Um, 
you know, you've you've now moved from uh, from the space industry into the aviation industry. You've you've built up manufacturing at multiple organizations, and now you're you're about to do it again. Uh, you or you are doing it again. What are what are some of the the challenges that make you that make you nervous when it comes to, you know, now insourcing, manufacturing, hiring talent, uh, building up that uh, supply chain and manufacturing capacity? What makes you a bit uh, a bit nervous, or where you know that you're gonna have to really focus to to to, to get it right? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, talent is probably the most concerning, and I'm sure any other manufacturer would say the same. Uh, it's a highly competitive talent market um, for the the right folks and the ones that have the skill set, especially when it comes to additives. You know, um, it's it's not an, an a vastly large uh, industry compared to to some other manufacturing methods like stamping or injection molding. Um, so the knowledge base is is not well distributed. So I would say my biggest concern as it relates to additive is is just finding the right um, engineers and technicians and support staff um, to operate the printers, produce parts, um, keep you know challenging the status quo and coming up with cutting edge uh, technology and and parameter uh, sets to produce the parts. Um, also, uh, you know, we all just came out of a, a global pandemic, um, where the supply base was significantly impacted. So I think that's also a concern on my mind and on a lot of people's mind is if there's another, um, uh, global pandemic or geopolitical crisis or something like that, is that going to make it difficult for us to, uh, source the materials needed, um, for, uh, production, which I think would plague any, any other manufacturing company. Um, and then ultimately it's, uh, looking at, you know, really being honest with yourself and, and having a challenge of, of figuring out what makes sense to make, what makes sense to buy. Um, and then if it is a make, you know, what are the best methods that lend the most value to, to fabricating those components? So, um, yeah, I would say talent, global supply, supply chain, um, for raw materials and things like that. Um, and then determining the best possible methods to make a uh, specific piece of hardware are probably the biggest challenges. Yeah. Probably, uh, universal, uh, challenges like you, like you mentioned, especially in, in relative. um, yeah, talent is a, is a big one. Even though I do have a feeling that the talent market is relaxing uh, a little bit as universities are actually starting to, uh, to teach, to teach additive manufacturing. We have a few uh community colleges starting to uh to educate um even we have a a a center now around education so i'm hoping that we can get the the workforce ramped up uh, a little bit yeah i think they're doing a great job um you know here in long beach with the local colleges um of proliferating additive knowledge and and additive technology you know getting machines in letting people um, get their hands on them and work with them. Um, so uh, it's a great, uh, you know, it's been great to see, um, and would love to see that, uh, kind of proliferate and make its way out through, uh, the rest of the country as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe just going back a little bit, maybe one additional challenge is, you know, one of the parts of, of one of the biggest pieces of doing manufacturing is designing factories. Um, so really making all the trades on floor space and kind of understanding the full picture of what's going on um, can, can be quite, uh, nerve wracking and challenging to make sure that you get it right the first time and you don't have to uproot things or destroy foundations or anything like that. Um, but there is a lot of great, uh, modern technology that helps with, um, creating like a digital twin, uh, of the factory and running analysis and things like that, uh, before you ever populate it, uh, with any hardware, uh, or machines or anything like that. We work really closely with, um, Siemens. Uh, who has um, some, some pretty awesome products in their portfolio for doing factory planning, virtual commissioning, things like that. So that's, that's taken a lot of the, the nerves out of the equation uh, and kind of the guesswork of, of wondering whether, um, you know, once you build the factory and you start running operations, uh, what kind of challenges, roadblocks, uh, logistical issues are you going to encounter? So I think that's also been, been a great um, advantage uh, to see come out uh, to, to demystify and de-risk the factory building process. Yeah, no, we've actually, we've also used uh, Siemens Technomatics for some factory oh, planning. It's, it's a cool tool uh, to, yeah, to plan manufacturing environments, production, downtime, uh, even worker paths. I thought it was very interesting to, 
to really simulate that that environment. And it's uh, it helps you to really un understand what your potential output and bottlenecks are. Yeah, it's great. We love it. It's once again, you know, just the benefit of building factories and, and building um, a new product in the digital age. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, if you compare your career now from, you know, from, from those previous, uh, previous positions, what's, what was it like to, to enter the aviation industry? Is it, uh, uh, is it comparable to, uh, to space? Is it a completely different culture dynamic and environments? What is it like? Yeah. Um, you know, the jokes abound of me not being a space guy anymore. I'm an airplane guy now, as my yeah. uh, colleagues like to, like to remind me, uh, which I'm perfectly happy with. Um, you know, I've kind of, kind of fallen in love with, uh, with aircraft and, and I've seen some pretty amazing, uh, technology, um, that I'm excited about. Um, the regulatory environment in aviation is obviously much more stringent, um, but it's also much more well understood. Um, you know, the, the part 25 makes the requirements clear for what has to be done to certify an aircraft. Mm -hmm. Um, but I've, I've appreciated, uh, you know, at, at jet zero that, um, it's a really nice melding of kind of startup or space, uh, people, um, and, uh, folks that have, you know, 20, 30 years of experience in aviation and come from much larger uh, legacy companies. So I would say it's, um, it's, it's hasn't been quite a culture shock, um, because there's, uh, a lot of urgency and innovation and, and, um, similar focus on quality. Um, but certainly, um, there's, uh, a lot more rigor, uh, with the things that we do in, in aviation. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of different requirements, uh, as well. Um, uh, you know, I'm used to looking at, uh, rocket engines that have, you know, 400, 500,000 pounds of thrust. Um, and, you know, now I'm looking at engines that are, you know, 20 to 40 to 60,000 pounds of thrust, uh, but are much larger. So that's also been an, an interesting, uh, transition for me, um, as well. But yeah, I would say it's, um, not necessarily a culture shock, um, because, you know, Jet Zero has a nice blending of sense of urgency and innovation along with, um, you know, rigor and a focus on quality. Um, but it's, it's definitely different. Okay. So when will we see a, a blended wing design airplane in the air? Um, well, if you ask people that are flying on modern tube and wing aircraft, the answer would be not soon enough. Um, everyone that comes here to visit us in our facility, um, they, they go through our, um, you know, uh, mock-ups here and, and it kind of ruins their flight home, but in a good way. Um, so, uh, over the next couple of years, we're going to be continuing our subscale development program. Um, so those are, you know, 12 and a half percent scale, uh, vehicles and, and other vehicles as well. Um. And then, uh, the demonstrator aircraft, which will be the first full-sized one that we build, um, that will fly in 2027. Uh, we're building that in partnership with Northrop Grumman, uh, and their subsidiary scale composites, um, who's really the best place in the world to go to build a, a prototype composite aircraft. Um, and then, uh, for the commercial, uh, variant, we're targeting an entry into service, uh, in the 2030s. Okay. That's not, not too far away. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, every, myself included, every time I fly on, uh, a modern tube and wing aircraft, I just, uh, become quite the critic and I, I just say, I can't wait until there's something better. Yeah. I'll be on a plane on Sunday. I'll be critiquing, uh, and thinking of, uh, of what you just said. Um, right. I have, uh, I have one more question, which is you're still very much, uh, on the pulse of, uh, of, of additive. You're also, I think, speaking at ICAM again, uh, this year. What are the, the developments that you're, you're kind of excited about in the, uh, in, in the industry? Is it in the material space, in the machine space, in the software space? Where do you see a lot of, uh, also potential impact for, uh, for your work at Jet Zero, uh, that you're, uh, gets you, gets you, uh, excited? Yeah. Great question. Um, materials, um, I mean, as a, I'll put on my space cap for five seconds, which is, uh, 
materials. I'm excited to see some low cost uh, refractory alloy options coming out. You know, I think uh, C103 has kind of been the world the roost for a long time, but it's quite expensive. So I'm excited cool. to see some some folks experimenting with uh, printing newer uh, refractory alloys that are that are much cheaper. So I'll keep my eye on those developments, and then I'll pop back on the uh, aviation cap. Um, mach machine wise, um, I think um, you know if I can do a shameless plug, I think the the new systems that uh, EOS has planned on the horizon, whether they're custom systems from AMCM um, or uh, the much larger format system uh, that you're currently developing. I think those are going to be huge uh, players, uh, whether it's producing a lot of components in a single build volume and not having to do so many turnovers, which I'm a big fan of, um, or producing much larger structural components that come with this amazing, you know, data report and packet, I think are great. Um, you know, I've seen some uh, amazing advances on the software front as well. Um, not sure if we spoke about it last time, but um, one of my favorite products, uh, Software wise on the market today is Smart Fusion uh, from uh, EOS. You know, we uh, were able to produce uh, zero degree overhangs uh, reliably at my last gig um, using Smart Fusion. And I'm excited to see uh, all the benefits of support reduction, material property uh, enhancement, um, and um, um, uh, post processing reduction that's, that's possible uh, with Smart Fusion. Um, let's see what else. I also have been a big fan of the, uh, AL five X one material, um, mm. from, uh, from EOS. Uh, when I first heard about it, um, you know, I was actually, it was kind of serendipitous because I was in the market for high strength aluminum alloy. Uh, but a lot of the alloys that we were looking at, um, had, uh, pretty considerable post-processing requirements, whether it's a, uh, water quench in a furnace or anything like that. So it's pretty excited to see, you know, the material properties that you could get alongside uh, a simplified um, heat treating uh, recipe. So I think there's a lot of good stuff going on all fronts. Um, you know, the the availability of large format printers, um, the availability of materials, um, and then software enhancements. Um, and one thing I'm keeping a close eye on, and I'm sure the rest of the market is as well, is generative design and topological optimization. Um, I think there's a lot of benefits that are available there and, and, and I think it's kind of the way of the future. Um, but similar to how additive was originally, I think there's still a lot of mysticism that surrounds it. Um, and a lot of folks on the more, uh, qualification and certification side that would say, you know, show me your data and, and your loads and how you model this and things like that. So it's, it's something I'm going to be keeping a, a close watch on. Um, but also something that I think has huge potential to lend a lot of benefit. Interesting. And I, uh. I promise we did not <laughs> pay Tim to uh, to endorse uh, EOS here. Um, uh, we really are trying to to make this a agnostic podcast, but um, I'm glad uh, you're uh, you're you're a fan of the the new technologies that are that are coming out. Um, actually, I do want to double click on what you just said, uh, which is topology optimization, because what I've recently, well, it's actually more than recently over the past year or so. Uh, I am realizing that we see a lot of production parts that are actually not topology optimized that look kind of conventional, but are additively manufactured. We see a lot of the benefits uh, on the supply chain side and the low volume manufacturing uh, spectrum. Is, is, is the certification aspect and missing data on topology optimized parts the, the hindering factor? Is it the... The, the 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 chemical engineers that develop these applications, there seems to be a mismatch. Do you have an idea on uh, on why that is? Yeah, I would say um, I think it really is the qualification certification, right? Because especially in aerospace and defense, um, the loads are relatively dynamic uh, versus some other applications for topology optimization. Um, mm. But you know the way that we can get over that hurdle and demystify it overall. Um, is to build parts, test them, show that they work, um, show the correlation of uh, the material properties, the data, the loads, the testing, so on and so forth, um, and you know keep feeding that back into the model. I'm sure AI will also play a huge role, you know, in in learning um, and and adapting to um, you know the cycle of kind of build, test, repeat. Um, so I I think the hindrance to adoption has certainly been 
mostly focused on qualification certification. There's probably also a lack of familiarity um, with uh, topology optimization. Some great companies out there that are coming out with pretty easy to use um, software uh, to do it. Um, but I think it's one of those things that it's just like, we have to talk about it. We have to study it. We have to show that it works um, and we have to overall demystify it similar to what's been done uh, in additive over the past couple of decades. Yeah, no, I agree. It'll, it'll take some time. Um, but I wanted to mention it because it is a, an interesting development and actually it's not a bad, uh, it's not a bad thing. If we are able to get conventional design parts printed additively with a positive business case then generative design is just going to open up a, a completely new sector of, uh, of applications. So I think it's a, a positive and uh, I'm actually really excited to even see these boring parts uh, being printed today. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would agree with that. You know, it's, um, I said it kind of at the top, um, it doesn't have to be all additive all the time, but I think to your point, generative design and, and topology optimization does open up more business cases where you might have what some people would consider just like a dumb or simple bracket um, that actually could be optimized, but then could only be produced with additives. So I think it does open up a lot more applications um, and opportunities to consolidate parts and reduce mass overall. So I think it'll it'll be a great driving factor for the continued proliferation and adoption of additives throughout the market. Yep. All right. One last uh, word of advice from you. Uh, what should companies, teams, leaders do when they try to to implement additive manufacturing? We sometimes, you know, in additive, we think everybody uh, is using additive, but uh, the opposite is true. The majority of companies uh, are still just looking into it uh, and, uh, and and hearing about it. What's some advice you can give for for those uh, for those teams that are looking into it? Uh, I would say if, if the organization is reluctant to try it or adopt it, um, you know, dip a toe in, you know, work with a, um, a service bureau or um, a platform manufacturer to pathfind one application, run trade studies on it, show the benefit that's possible, make some parts, get them in your hands, test them, play around with them, um, and, you know, help to drive the, the comfort level and knowledge within your organization. Um, I'd also, you know, I'm a voracious reader of everything additive related. So I've read, you know, a lot of technical papers and things like that about different additive methods. Um, and also, you know, going beyond powder bed fusion, I would consider, you know, what other additive methods can lend benefit, you know, where you have maybe large scale, extremely large components that don't make sense to print, you know, a, a nominal powder bed fusion build volume. Um, and you don't need as much, uh, high resolution of the features. Um, but you can really produce very large parts that require no tooling um, and, you know, can, can also incorporate topological optimization and, and generative design as well. So you got to start somewhere. Um, and I would start with um, finding one application where you suspect that additive can lend benefit um, and using that as, uh, I don't know, a Trojan horse to kind of bring in, uh, raise the comfort level and awareness around additives uh, within your organization. Um, I do think there's been a great, um, increase of, uh, availability of service providers, whether it's, um, Adman or, or other companies. Um, so it, they've kind of opened the door to, Hey, we think that we, uh, would get some benefit from printing this park. We want to try it out. Um, you know, can you make it for us? And then you can learn a lot in that process, um, and, and learning from people that have done it, um, which ultimately make you better, uh, practicer of additive in the future as well. So. I would, I would find, you know, stake out your claim, find a part that you think makes sense to print, follow it through the full life cycle, run all the trade studies, understand where additive is, is lending a lot of benefit to this part. Um, and then once you go through that cycle and, and you're, you have something that you're happy with, then find more opportunities, branch out from there. Um, you know, look at similar components, and then eventually, uh, kind of cross the value stream, uh, where else can additive lend benefit. Yeah. I like it. Education. A little bit of boldness and uh, 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 just trying it out. And the Trojan horse is probably one of the best pieces of advice. People uh, that resist uh, once they once they really uh, realize that it's possible, uh, oftentimes they do change their mind. Um, yeah. Hey, it was 
awesome to have you on the show again. Uh, I learned a lot again, uh, this time around uh, aviation. I'm excited to uh, to hop on a plane this Sunday and uh, and kind of criticize the uh, the old school designs and uh, hopefully in 10 years or so get to uh, jump on a Jet Zero. Uh, thanks for sharing your expertise and your uh, experience with us. Uh, as always, it was uh, super educational. So thanks again. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Appreciate the chat. And uh, thank you out there for, for tuning in today. I hope you enjoyed uh, my conversation with Tim as much as I did. Uh, if you did, please comment, share this episode with your friends, coworkers, uh, or uh, even your kids and spouse. Um, if you have questions, leave a comment or show us an email at additive.snack at eos-na.com. And I will see you next time here at the Additive Snack Podcast. I'm your host, Fabian Anderfeld, and I'll see you there. Mm -hmm.